a very good evening to all of you so a warm welcome to this institute lecture so before going to introduce our guest speaker i request swati modi to felicitate our speaker with a bouquet okay so the introduction of a speaker goes like this dr bala subramaniam he is a development activist who is a physician by qualification after his mbbs he earned his mphil in hospital administration and health systems management from bits piloni he has a masters in public administration from the harvard kennedy school harvard university his living habits were greatly influenced by the teachings of swami vivekananda and at the age of 19 he founded the swami vivekananda youth movement based on the principles of ahimsa satya seva and tyaga he has spent the last 31 years of his life in the service of the rural and tribal poor in the forests of india he has built this non profit organization into india's leading development ngo and the swami vivekananda youth movement today runs seven institutions and more than 50 projects reaching out to more than a million people across the state of karnataka it also has centers in the usa and uk he is also the founder and chairman of grassroots research and advocacy movement he is also the recipient of numerous other state and national awards apart from lecturing and teaching regularly at many reputed universities around the world on leadership he was the distinguished frank rhodes professor at cornell university usa he was the head and visiting professor of the vivekananda chair of the university of mysore he has traveled widely within and outside the country promoting the concept of participatory sustainable development which is contextually relevant and culturally appropriate he is a tata scholar a mason fellow of the harvard kennedy school and a fellow at the hauser center for non profits harvard university he has authored five books and he also writes extensively about swami vivekananda and on development issues in local kannada and english newspapers so with this introduction i request today's guest speaker to deliver his guest lecture thank you professor anil for the introduction <clears throat> it's a pleasure coming to iit roorkee for two reasons one to see a full overflowing hall is always a pleasure for any speaker and the second most confidential reason is many many years ago when it was still called university of roorkee uh, and it was very well known across the country even then i decided to take the entrance exam to come to roorkee i don't know whether it's misfortune or good fortune the exams for my second year pre university the board exams got postponed because the question papers leaked and the new dates unfortunately coincided with the exams of the entrance exams of roorkee so i did not take it take the exam at all and so maybe i can keep going back and saying i nearly got there but i didn't but today i have actually got here so it's thanks to the institute for for having me over and letting me share some thoughts now we are at a moment of extraordinary change it's a fascinatingly exciting a change which i'm sure many of us haven't fully comprehended and we simply attribute the change to political environment and the ecosystem but it's so exciting we really don't know what's happening and i i remember just a week ago uh, one of the young boys whom i mentored and he set up a company and then he came to me and said you really don't know how to use social media he sort of was summarily dismissive of my abilities 
he just sat with me for two hours and in those two hours he's made me such a prominent figure in the social media space now i'm on facebook i'm on instagram i'm on twitter i'm on linkedin i don't know what else is there left now and he also told me you don't have to worry because it's all interconnected and now we want to interconnect the nation we want to interconnect the world as i sat back and i told him how many people will i get known to and i just released the book last week in bangalore and he said don't worry you just give me a thousand rupees and he just put something in and said facebook tells me that you'll reach 80000 people he wanted to know what age groups i wanted to reach out to now we really don't know whether facebook is telling us the truth but we want to believe it right and every day it keeps saying 42000 43000 what like a meter and they took me 1000 rupees away correctly but we presume that we reach out to so many people and this at a time in my own lifetime when i remember many many years ago i was in this forest and a friend of mine visited me and in the course of a conversation uh, he said this shouldn't have happened in india and no this only thing that shouldn't have happened in india that is different but as what happened he said you know a former prime minister got killed with a bomb explosion and he was narrating this incident three two or three weeks after the incident happened and that's only with the time i got to even know about it and today we get to know things within a minute i'm sure many of you are already sending out something on your twitter or facebook and then taking a picture here and there a video it's very difficult to speak in openness now because you're always worried where it's going to get uploaded and who's going to see it right it's so challenging to even be honest now it is now and such a fascinating world i just recall where i come from the forest and i ask myself will there will there come a day three decades of running my tribal school will i ever see the day when a little tribal child will walk into iit roorkee if it cannot happen in three decades when is it ever going to happen will the child ever have the opportunity that i had today of getting into facebook and telling the world what i'm doing or are we condemning 90% of india to a life which we don't even think about and we don't have the time to even ask these questions because the world is getting to go so fast that we just don't want to pause and ask so i am going to have some fun you are one of the brightest young men and women of india others you won't be where you are today so i'm going to have this is a world of mcqs and and these are questions the answers of which are not there in any social media because everything the social media talks about is you know we all fall in love with changing our photograph on facebook if you show red and top and green at the bottom we think we are indian now i want to challenge your very notion of being an indian now and i have a simple question that i want to ask you about this great country of which we all belong to so my first question i love walking around so can i i, I wouldn't mind coming down but anyway so my first question and simple question how many indians especially in rural areas have access to safe drinking water it's a world of mcqs right you're all a product of mcqs you're all trained to crack the code of exams now if i were to give an examination of india i have a very simple question how many indians have access to safe potable drinking water and a b c d all of the above none of the above and guess so i am sure i'm absolutely certain an audience as intelligent as you are can only resort to guessing because you really don't know the answer i'm actually provoking you if you can crack the iit je don't tell me you don't know the answer of how many people have access to drinking water any any intelligent guesses wow then it's something for us to be truly ashamed of okay first guess done about 50 about 50 so four choices already done a b c d over okay all of the above none of the above well it's one simple question i asked you and we're all struggling I'll ask a simpler question. How many Indians have access to a toilet? What a question to ask in the Institute of Technology, right? 
which is dreaming about landing people on the Mars. We build our Prime Minister in all his pride says that we are the country which can build the cheapest transportation to the Mars. But you are a country which can't lay a kilometer of road, doesn't get spoilt in one season. It's a strange paradox in our country. When you can build all those fascinating objects, and yesterday we launched a great satellite. But why can't we find 4,000 rupees for a toilet in this country? And how many Indians can access a toilet? What an embarrassing question to ask, right? Any intelligent guesses again? 55. Less than 30 percent, 55 percent. 52%. Many, many years ago, I am not even sure if all of you followed this. In our Indian parliament, the then Prime Minister called something a national shame. What do you think he was referring to? Because we are talking of exciting times, right? We are talking of building a great nation. How do we build a great nation if you don't even know your nation? Am I right? So what did he call as a great national shame? In my opinion, he not only called it a great national shame, but knowing nothing about it as a Prime Minister of India was a greater national shame. He called malnutrition in this country a great national shame. 54 percent of our children less than five years old are malnourished. And they don't have to be so. That's what makes me so angry. They don't have to be malnourished in this country. We are grain sufficient. Yet, 68 percent of Indians consume less than 1800 kilocalories every day. We have 680 million metric tons of food grains rotting out in the open and we want to build an IIT in every state, but we don't have the post harvest technology to prevent 30 percent of food grains going down the drain. I think that's a great national shame too, right? We have such extraordinary talent in this country, but do we have the passion and the vision to use that talent for India's growth? That's what I'm going to share today. So my vision for India's development is not driven by just quoting, throwing out statistics to all of you. I'm not trying to narrate India's problems. All of us are experienced in some way or the other. But I'm going to share the glory and the greatness that we all enjoyed for a long, long time. And what went wrong? And can we learn lessons from our past? Can we reconstruct the na national future by looking back not only at the past and learning from it, discarding what is not good for this country, but building on what is actually good. And with that dream, what a great country we can all build. It's a very simple vision where every one of us can participate. So I intend over the next 15, 20 minutes just sharing some thoughts. I'm not even saying these are perfect, these are right. This is work in progress. But it's something worth trying, right? It at least be better than, you know, I, I was actually laughing. A company like Google or Microsoft, I don't remember which, proudly says 500 railway stations in this country will have free Wi-Fi. And then that is digital India. Oh my God, something must be really great or wrong. The 500 Wi-Fi stations are established in all railway stations. How did it even change India? We spend crores of rupees in beautifying our airports, but we don't have decent bus stations in rural India. We don't even consider the cost of investing on public transport in rural India, where it really matters. We have every jeep or any, any village, whether it's Karnataka or Madhya Pradesh or Uttar Pradesh, every little vehicle that runs in rural India has got 20 people hanging out of it. Right? The, the, one of the 10 most important, one, of, one among the largest reasons why people in India die, the top 10 reasons for death in India is road transport accidents. We don't even think about it. RTAs, when I was a medical student, we were wondering about should it, was it cardiovascular illnesses or was it diabetes or something else. But today we talk of road transport accidents as one amongst the ten. It is a very troubling fact. We have great technology to bring big, great cars into this country. We have young 17, 18 year olds think that zipping away 90 kilometers on a road which is like a maze is great. But then we lose lives. I had a recent statistics collected and verified in Mysore, a city of Mysore. In the last six months in the city of Mysore, close to 60 people died in road accidents, just in one small city. And most of them who died were young men and women between 18 and 26 years old. What is the point in talking of demographic dividend when you sacrifice our young on the streets of India? 
something is wrong there, right? We've got to do something about it. Can we really think of all this and wonder what went wrong? Now, I would like to present to you a new vision of India based on what India had. How many of you have heard about a historian called Angus Madison? You have? Have you read his report? He, you know, many, many years ago, when he was still alive, he's no longer alive now, the United Nations and the World Bank went into a tizzy. Why did they go into a tizzy? Because they suddenly realized the U.S. economy is collapsing. And they were convinced, as they are convinced today, with the dollar appreciating so much, that the U.S. government is a critical reason why the world exists. Right? In the United States, everything is world tournament. Ten teams play basketball, they call it world basketball tournament. And the 20 teams play hockey, they call it World Hockey Tournament. Because their world is a little continent called the United States. So I don't blame them. And, and when they went into a real problem and a mess, everybody woke up and said, we got to figure out why they got into a mess. But that's too dangerous to figure out. So they said, let's find out. They had an alternate counter question. The simple question they asked is, let's find out which country in this world has actually did well for a long time. If some country could have sustainedly progressed for a reasonably long period of time, and if there are lessons to be learned from that country, why not we actually pick those lessons and see if they are transplantable into the modern era, contextualize it for today, and see if we can save this world from collapsing. So they gave this job to an historian and said, go back in history and find out the last 2000 years post Christ, has there been any country which you think has done well? And unfortunately, the only measurement of doing well is unfortunately the GDP. Now, I am not, I am sure there must be a few economists in the audience. Pardon me, I would like to make full disclosures. I am not a fan of economists. Though I have studied economics only to make sure that I can criticize them with authority. It helps, right? And, and, and the whole world has fallen in love with GDP, including our government today. And we think if you race with China and go ahead, 8.5% will change India. But it doesn't work that way. But GDP is the only metric that the world understands, so they used it. And Angus Madison figured out that this great extraordinary, any country which could have progressed sustainably is what he's tried to do. And the first 100 years post Christ, he did all his calculations and all the kind of simulated models that you can create in statistical packages you have today. And he ended up saying that, oh my God, there has been one country which did well for 100 continuous years. And he said, that's India. For a British historian to acknowledge India's greatness, take some time. He said, it's India. And then he went on, and the next 100 years, India again. The third 100 years, India again. Now I can cut a long story short. And 1600 years, he discovered post-Christ, the only country which was the leading GDP in this world was India. Between India and China, two great civilizations, 68% of the global, global economy came from this part of the world. 17th century, something happened. We sort of applied our brakes, or sort of barriers were created for this great country, where we had to apply our brakes. And China overtook us. And 18th century, both the countries collapsed. Today in India, fifth largest number of billionaires live in this country. In today's India, one third of the global poverty burden exists in this country. Every third poor man who can be called poor based on econometric terms, either you have a dollar a day or less than $1.25 a day, lives in this great country of ours. And we are not worried about it. Despite all the statistics that the erstwhile planning commission threw up for the present, whatever you call the Diog, I don't even know if they are existing nowadays. So at least on paper here and there they come up. And, and we realize but with all of modern advancements, with all the intentions of Swachh Bharat and water and sanitation, all the programs that we can bring in, despite the greatest efforts, we are able to provide safe drinking water. And I'm using the word safe very, very cautiously to less than 45% of India's population. We are able to get access to a toilet. Not, not, not every family has a toilet, but at least accessing a toilet to nearly 30-35% of our people today. 54% of our children are malnourished. And I told you, none of this needs to be so. We are a country where wealth is no longer a problem. Resources are no longer a problem. We need people who can just build simple visions to redeploy the resources to build a great country. 
So if you go back to the 1600 years I spoke, when the whole world is gushing about saying India did a great job for 1600 years, I am not looking at the fact that GDP was great. I am trying to understand why was the GDP great? What did we do right for 1600 years that we actually ended up having GDP as something important for us? In my belief, if you deconstruct it, and if you look at the last 400 years, nothing worth our name has come out of this great country of ours. Now, we live in a generation when you're all getting trained to be great people. I really want to understand what have we contributed in 300, 400 years. We don't even know how to make a simple cell phone in this country. We have to get parts from China and Taiwan and Korea. How, how long ago since we had an original idea that came out of this country? When was the last innovative thought that shook the world? Where is India's leadership in thought and ideation? Fuck somewhere. God knows where. Aren't we capable of that even? But the first, all our critical contributions to human development and progress happened in the first 1600 years of the millennium. If you actually deconstruct, we all talk, we all write from Science Congress to everybody who's in love with India, we bring out books called Pride of India, and everything is 1600 before, right? We say we discovered zero, we have the binary system, we had calculus, we had trigonometry, we had astronomy, astrophysics, but when? All in the past. But my friends, the time has come. We need to recalibrate now. We need to wake up. We are not idiots. We need to wake up and tell the world India is still alive and vibrant and well. We need to reshape a vision, trying to understand what worked for us for 1600 years. So my fundamental belief is, instead of investing our time and energy and building a great GDP, a great economic engine that what everybody wants, let us go back and build what cost the great economic engine for 1600 years. What we had cracked the code in many ways in India, in the Indian ecosystem, was to look at constantly building the human and social capital of this country. Whether it was democracy at the grassroots, whether it was flourishing spirit of self-inquiry, whether it was scientific attainment, whether it was the spiritual thought that this woke up this nation to greatness. We had so much that worked for us because our intent was not GDP. Our intent was building our human capital, building the social capital that connects all of us. Economic consequences of what ensued because of that. Just the mere economic consequences made us the number one GDP. So my vision for India is how do we reinvest and redeploy our energies on creating that fascinating experiment where we invest on human and social capital. And I'm convinced economic consequences will flow and we have an extraordinary nation. And this is exactly what Swami Vivekananda dreamed. When 100, 120 years ago, when he called this country to wake up and told the young people to make their own destiny, he said, give me a handful of young men and women and I'll change this world, not just this country. And that handful of young men and women is an extraordinary opportunity for you now. And why is it an opportunity for you? Because we have never had a situation that exists in Indian history as it exists today. Just imagine, 78% of us Indians are less than 40 years. It has never happened before. I am now beyond the margin. Most of your faculty are out of this. So don't even look up to them. I'm open about it. Look up to yourselves because you can make the change. If 78% of you Indians decide this is the direction India is going to grow, it has to go that way. Nearly 50% or 55% of Indians are less than 20. Mostly your age. Just imagine the joy we can get. So instead of sitting back and complaining that is not okay, this is not okay, just imagine if every Indian less than 40 says, I am going to be part of the change that is going to make it okay. Wow, 78% of India is going to change that. Instead of waiting for a man to sit at the top and wave a magic wand and say, I've changed India. Instead of waiting for a man to hold a broom and say, here my Indian, I'm going to clean up India. If every one of us decide, this is the way I'm going to live. If IIT Roorkee makes a decision today, in none of its events, it'll have plastic. That is change. Can we make a beginning that way? Can we decide that we will be the change that we want to see? Then development happens. Just sit back and ask yourself, how can a small little institution sitting on the banks of the Charles River produce more scientific papers than the whole of this country put together? We, and we keep saying every reference, we say one and a quarter billion people. He said, every time somebody says it, I burn. How can a little MIT do more than all of us put together? 
and most of the time half the people doing that are people who gone from here that makes you feel more bad that what is it that we have done or not done where our human capital can get expressed in this great country of ours so it's time to ask these hard questions it's time to ponder over the fact what have we done or not done in educational system we are all fallen in love with the wrong paradigms i was in andhra pradesh or oh, i can't say that now the single state andhra pradesh 4 months ago and i saw this fascinating tall buildings littered across state not just even peri urban areas suburban areas semi urban areas and i was curious so i was somebody i was having a very senior i was i had gone there to train some teachers and i asked the man who heads the department what are all these nice looking buildings they look like schools or colleges but they didn't seem because there's no life outside there's no vibrant life outside in the streets of the college on something like you know strange looking prisons but beautiful buildings so i thought maybe the government has re- reformulated its strategy making the prisons more livable and then it told me no sir these are the krishnas and chaitanyas or something means it's narayanas they that one state is a 6000 crore industry to rob away your childhood for five or six long years and i am really concerned that what are we building what kind of human capital we create human capital is not just cognitive acquisitions if you cannot know a rural indian doesn't is not able to access a toilet what have you learned but you will know how to build the cheapest toilet but for whom i don't know human capital an expansion of human capital is expanding the heart body mind and soul if we can't produce a new generation of children whose heart body mind and soul is expanded by our system well you'll end up with malformed children and that's how i would call every one of you here we are all wired to be malformed but it's not too late can we reconfigure can we rewire can we focus on desiring that empathy and vivekananda had a beautiful answer he said all that the young generation of india need is the three h he said all that the development vision for india need is the three h the first h he said the heart to feel he said feel my children feel feel for the poor the downtrodden the ignorant the marginalized feel till your heart stops and your mind reels and you fall down dead he said that's the kind of power of feeling we need to generate now all of us feel today we all feel so strongly i keep telling my young people my young friends you travel in a public bus you are sitting in a seat a old lady with a grandchild gets into the bus we all feel we want to give the seat to her we keep feeling but the butt is not moving we are all want to give and 10 minutes later the woman gets down at a stop and goes away and then you tell your friend i wanted to give her the seat but she got down that feeling alone is not enough that's why vivekananda said the next hedge the head to think how do i participate in the solution stating the problem doesn't help anybody i can talk about malnutrition i can talk about drinking water i can talk about food crisis but what do i in my little environment with all my constraints and limitations how do i bring about change have the head to think you're all extraordinary people the nation has invested a lot of you lot on you and remember what vivekananda said i call every young man a traitor who having been educated at people's expense pays not the least heed to them so when you don't think how you can be part of the solution and remember when we are part of the problem we have to be part of the solution don't externalize it as if somebody else is going to solve it for me and final h and that is a good, good, real real commitment is the hands to work we can't think of the problem stated we can't think of the solution on the blueprint on the blackboard and then sit back and say somebody else will implement it those students in the sec- two, second tier third tier colleges they have to be in india after all they'll take care of it it doesn't work that way we have to be part of the change and if we can actually work this out extraordinary work can be done we have been a nation which has been conspired against subtly for the last 200 or 300 years i'll give a simple experiments 1730 our share of global trade was 20% even in 1730 when our economy was declining in 80 years when we remeasured it in 1810 our share of world trade was 2% even before the rest of the world new ships can float on water 
Chinese and Indians have already built their ships. We are so far advanced and that is why trade happened for India. Everything that we produce from the un unprocessed pepper to processed material to the silk raw to the cloth that we could make was sold and bought around the world. And what were we taught in our history? Vasco da Gama discovered India. What a greater lie that could be fed to this nation. Vasco da Gama never discovered India. I am not saying it. Vasco da Gama said it. I think there is a world of Google and somebody must be already doing it out there. If you go Google of Vasco da Gama's journals that he left behind in Spanish, he writes, he was a man who thought he built the biggest ship in the world. He was the captain of the largest ship in the world and he was going around the world, discover, coming to discover the world. And he was so frightened, that poor man. He writes, I, I, my ship used to always sail in the ocean, keeping the land in sight. Because he's afraid that if he wandered away, you don't know where he would go. Because those guys didn't figure out that the world was round or square or they suddenly go drop down, right? Like the movie came, what that uh, the African movie, when I, was, when I was younger, I saw that movie. But there's a Coca-Cola bottle, it, gods must be crazy. They actually believed gods must be crazy and they didn't want to go too far. And he says, as I sailed around the Cape of Good Hope in Africa, on one side I'm seeing the land of Africa, I suddenly see an armada of ships coming towards me. He says, I got nervous and frightened, such large ships. Here I was with the arrogance and I built the biggest ship in the world and there are ships ten times the size of my ship and ten times the number coming towards me. I got so nervous, I went and anchored where they anchored, went and met the captain of the armada and he told me I come from a country called Bharat or India or whatever you call it. And he took me there. I had the courage to follow him because I was very sure where he was going. And he brought him to Kogi Court. And we invite that blighter to come here. He didn't discover us. So at least from now on, learn the real India. And this is what he wrote. And what are we taught? So constantly we've been fed for 200, 300 years an imaginary history where we don't even take pride in what we did. So what we need by this expression of human capital is pride, self-esteem, dignity. And as we acquire it, we'll get enormous change. Our entire fabric of the nation was built on social capital. We have successfully deconstructed that in the last 20 years, or 30 years, increasingly, more so in the last 60 years. By, by the time we got our freedom, 350 million people were there. Only half percent of the world trade was there. And how did it happen? The British brought in a simple policy which none of us even noticed. Their policy was very clear. They said, we will not decimate India. Their policy was trade from India can happen only when you ship your products in British made ships. Look at this intelligent fellows. They took teak wood from the forest where I lived, shipped it all the way to their country, made the ship there and sold it back to us. And it was six times the cost that Indian traders had to pay than what a British trader would pay. Essentially created so many barriers to an Indian trader that made trade impossible for him to flourish. And gradually over 80 years decimated us. They refused to allow us the benefits of industrialization. They refused to allow us the benefit of the industrial revolution. Destroyed the institutions that flourished in India the educational democratic institution that existed. And then here we are and took away our dignity. And we are all in a nation where we all want to make a change. We are all talking of a knowledge society. Now, we were a knowledge society. We will have to rediscover that knowledge. And what kind of an India we build? We live in a state where our planners don't even understand. To me, human capital is acquiring those skills that we need. And I see English as a skill. I love my mother tongue. I write in my mother tongue. Oh, that's my borrowed mother tongue. And I write very well. I've written four books in my mother tongue. But I also know that, if you look at the internet, 22 billion documents are out on the internet in English. There are only 6 million or so in Indian languages. So we need our Indian languages. Let's take pride. But if the world operates in the world of business in English, let's acquire it as a skill. Language is part of our culture. English is only an instrument of transaction. Let's acquire that skill too. But you have a chief minister in my state who believes closed down all the English medium schools. Karnataka will progress. That's because his children have already gone to the best English medium schools and graduated. 
So, I think every state is falling in love with this kind of backward policies for the, in this, in the sake of, in whatever you call it, in this passion for language. But I believe my love for my language is different. My love to survive in an environment which demands acquisition of a particular skill is different. So, can we create this India? And I'm sure we can. And I can keep going on and on, but I thought I should spend more time listening to you, hearing from you, because I came here not to talk, full confession. I came here to listen. Because in each one of your ideas, there could be so much potential. There could be so many things one can learn. But that's what I would like to go back with. And so as we talk and engage, I'll possibly share some more ideas and some more practical constructs in which we can de deconstruct what I've been saying till now. And then have an exchange. So I would like to stop here. The rest 20 minutes that we have to ask if you'd like to know more, if you'd like to understand what I do, if you'd like to see what we are doing. And we are running experiments. For 30 years I've been running experiments. And I have demonstrated that whatever I speak can be done. And today, I would like to challenge the world of development and development economists and practitioners that I am creating models which can actually be remodeled, which can be replicated. We are trying to create measurements where we can actually produce scientific validation of what we are doing and hopefully show the world a new model. So when Vivekananda said India should be a Jagan Mata, Jagat Guru, he didn't say talking about religion from the top of the tower. He said, we show the world the way to live. And the most sustainable, contextually relevant existence, I think India can show the world. And if we can actually show the world that creating human capital is also about tolerance, it's also about universalism, it's also about harmony and peace, it's also as much about going beyond your boundaries of national barriers itself. It is not, citizenship is not just about India and the passport we hold. Citizenship is a responsibility to the 7 billion people of this world. If three and a half billion people in this world have less than a dollar a day, it should be as worrisome as the fact that 33% of the poverty is in India. That is the extraordinary spirit that we need to have. That's a message of Vasudeva Kutumbukam in its true sense. If we can do that, we'll truly be a world leader. World leader is not about having the largest nuclear arsenal. It's about having the wisdom to tell the world, I don't need a nuclear arsenal. Hopefully, we'll get there. And we'll get there fast enough because your generation is the only one which enjoys an extraordinary demographic dividend. Let's look at my generation. My father had three children. I had a small little job. My mother was a homemaker. So my father's one salary, five, was, five of us were dependent on us. His father had eight, eight children. The man had invested wisely. And he was a small little priest in a village. He had ten people dependent on him. Now I have only one son. My wife is an obstetrician. We really have only half a percent depend on each of us now. Now look at your generation. I am not even sure you guys will have kids anymore. You are so busy with your life, you may not even be having kids at all. There is nobody depend on you and you get out of your job, you, you start a job with a lakh rupee, a two lakh rupee, astronomical sums, right? You know, this IIT got so much, this IIM graduate got so much, it's a worrisome. I don't know what, you know what to do with that money at all. And we live in a world, I, I look at it because I teach at IIM Bangalore, every time this thing is put up on the notice board, they sort of with pride say, campus interview, two crore salary, three crore salary. And every IIM competes with each other saying, we got better salary for our students. And you know how they spend it? On a Friday evening, if you're traveling between Bangalore and Mysore, any from from Karnataka here? You should try traveling between Bangalore and Mysore on a Friday evening. 140 kilometer journey takes five, five and a half hours. And why? Because all the software fellows getting two pros from IIM decide to travel on the fancy motorcycles to come all the way midpoint between Bangalore and Mysore to have a cup of beer, a cup of coffee or a glass of beer. I can't believe the nonsensical way in which they spend. They just don't know how to spend money. The whole weekend is spent not knowing what to do. So you live in a world where the dependency ratios for this country is the lowest ever in its existence, in its civilizational existence, which means you hardly have anybody dependent on you. If you don't convert that into an asset. If you don't start seeing that the country is dependent on me, your family may no longer be dependent on you, but this country is dependent on you. If you cannot use the dependency ratios to your advantage, remember 30 years later this window will close. You are not going to have children, but you are going to get old. We are enjoying the benefits of very little dependencies. Dependency ratios, the number of people more than 14 years, less than 14 years, 
and more than 65 years dependent on the population in between. It's, we are dependent on the productive population between 14 and 65. 30 years later, you will all be hitting 50, 55, 60. You will have a huge number of us who are still alive, because healthcare will keep us alive. We will skew up the dependency ratios. You will hardly have children, but you will have a lot of old people to worry about. You will not have a generation to produce like you can produce today. And so, in your own interest, you better be taking care of this country. You better start thinking about policies and structures and systems which can actually connect us. So, in my opinion, my young friends, it's not making India that you have to worry about. You have to start making India next. We need to make Indians first. Let's make India next. And then make in India will happen on its own. So I end here again with a thanks for having me over and allowing me to share some thoughts. And hopefully, as we start talking, I'll be able to share some more. So if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to share whatever I can with you. I won't say what went wrong with us, I can say what went right with them, certain things, okay. The Japanese are great learners, they learned from the Meiji revolution. They understood that imitation is not a sin. They imitated without sacrificing their culture, no other country did it. They imitated westernization without losing their sense of Japan. Look at what they did when the tsunami happened and the reactors went down, I don't know how many of you even remember those TV visuals. They were all standing in line for collecting water from a store to buy water from a store, even after the tsunami, the power suddenly went off, because obviously it was a post-tsunami, right? And when the lights came on, they were still standing in line. Lights took seven minutes to come on. Imagine the same scene in India, even without a tsunami. Seven minutes you're standing, first of all, even if the current is there, you don't stand in line. And the power goes off, and you're actually suffering and suffocated with no food or water, and there's so much of water out there. Compare this also the scene with New Orleans from some years ago, when a rainfall which happens in one day in Mumbai, right, we know how to cope with it. New Orleans did not know. They had less problem about the rains and the damage the rain caused and the post rain damage that people did to each other. The raids and the stealing and the burglaries, something they are not recovered from. That culture is no different. So I think the Japanese learned build their country on the cultural foundation that they were known for. What we have lost is a cultural foundation. It's been very difficult to say this because we interpret culture as religion nowadays. Being Indian is different, being a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian is very different for me. I love being an Indian and I am proud being a Hindu too and that is why I can be both of it together. But Japanese were Japanese and they learned the best of all the worlds. Chinese it's a funny country. They got communism first and they're getting capitalism next. That's why it will not work for them for too long. We are very lucky people. We, we have democracy first, capitalism next. But what we have to worry about is if you and I go to sleep, in democracy the danger is allied captured by forces which we can't even imagine. Today Indian policy and polity is captured by powerful forces which is so powerful that 40 Indian families control 40% of India's GDP. The top 20% of India generates and controls 85% of India's wealth. The bottom 20% with whom I have lived controls and generates 1.5% of India's wealth. And I am not grudging their growth, but I am worried about these people whose capital is not built. And what do we do to them? We give rice at one rupee. We give them a free laptop. I dream of a country when we can build the human capital, when people have the dignity to earn the 40 rupees and buy rice in the market at 40 rupees and not stand as a beggar in front of the government for the subsidies that it throws. So that is human capital. And you and I have gone to sleep. The last budget, what do we look for in a budget? As an young Indian, you would look for a cell phone cost, the laptop cost, or something, or cigarettes which went down, or the alcohol excise duty exempted, right? And if your father's generation, they look at the cement came down, steel came down, whether the income tax came down. A faculty would look at that, I would look at that. But what we don't look at is a small line with the government of India and fine print puts it. Because they don't want you to, want you to read. 
is a small line called foregone revenues. This is a declaration made officially on the floor of the parliament by the finance minister of this country saying these are the taxation revenues in this country I can collect in the present day with the existing laws which I as the government decide to forego. You know how much it is? 534,000 crore rupees was in this budget, this financial year alone. The subsidy to the poor of this country was 250,000 crores, which they are all complaining about. The World Bank is telling them shut it down and they won't shut it down. I also believe it should be shut down, not for the reason that they are giving, but for the reason that the poor are not beggars. They have dignity to survive on their own and I can tell them how. I have shown them how. But the 534,000 crores given away was to the industries of India and 40% of that money went to 10 large industries. What subsidy are you talking about? Right? If you and I don't wake up, ask these questions, reduce the asymmetry of information and power that exists today, democracy will have no use to us. So what we need are enlightened citizens. What we need are empowered citizens that India had in the past. And that is what I say expanding human capital. And if you buy my book outside, that's what it talks about. May have to be loud. Yeah, most campuses are microcosms of the nation. You're culturally diverse, religiously diverse, you have got different ideas. So, I understand your question because I was also exactly like an, I was an activist. I've been beaten up, I've been arrested, I've done all my satyagras, I had my fun. But now, 20 years ago, I believed every corporate is a sinner. I believe the government is defunct and useless. But today, I've evolved. Vivekananda says it so beautifully. He said, it is not by a revolution, but only by an evolution can India arise. He said, it is not by pulling down the rich, but by pushing up the poor can a new India arise. I learnt it by hard experience. Today, I'm happy to say my thinking is different. I believe there are only two major institutions in this country which are permanent. One is the state. You can call it the government, you can call it whatever. In political terms, we call it the state. And one is the citizenry, the people, the community for whom we all exist. The citizens are the ones who contribute to the state. The state is what is meant to take care of the citizens. Because they have failed, many of us started our NGOs to fill gaps in what we thought the state is failing. And the civil society group was arrogant enough to think that we can supplant the government. Today, by experience, I'll tell you, at best, we can supplement the government. That is the reality. I believe the Indian constitution that we gave ourselves is one of the finest documents that we could ever created. And if we can just relive the con constitution of India, we can just make it action oriented, we would have solved India's problem. The fourth sector post-91 is the corporate sector. They are important. Now, I believe development is a constant expansion of human capability. It has to be the end outcome of a synergistic partnership between these four major players. Instead of spending our time saying, you didn't do this, I didn't do this, you didn't do this. Can we all look at each other and say, these are your strengths, these are my weaknesses, can we work together, can we collaborate, can we together make India a better place? I believe in that. And so today, I consult with government, I can, I'm advising to a lot of corporates. The same corporate I sued 20 years ago, today I'm their advisor. A lot of my activist friends tell me, you must have sold yourself. I sold myself because my ideology evolved. I sold myself to a new ideology. I'll give a small example. That corporate told me, the head of the corporate told me, we are in the business of extraction. We are an extractive industry. You can oppose me. You can tell me don't mind. You can tell me don't do this. But I have a simple question to ask you. Tomorrow morning when you're shaving, if you, you ask me which blade do you use, I said Gillette. He said, when you're shaving with your Gillette blade, ask yourself who made the steel on your blade. Ask yourself where did the chromium come for the blade to be so sharp. And then if you say I don't want the blade at all, then oppose me. So he told me, tell me how do I learn to make the blade or the steel for the blade 
without raping the environment. Tell me how to make it without exploiting the people I have to work with. Tell, teach me how to work with you to make things better. That's what taught me a lot. Today I spend my time walking around this country, working with all sorts of people, including I made the same presentation to the Prime Minister, telling him, let's focus on building the human capital this country needs. We are talking of skilling India. How can you skill India when you don't have the potential to absorb the skill you are giving? 70%, 99.5% of Indians when they graduate from 10th standard do not have an employable skill. We have a long way to go. We are getting a, I, I, I have a favorite story, I don't have the time to draw it here. I talk about the monkey story. We are asking the monkey to jump 600 feet with the river in between. When all it can jump is 3 feet. And it is so weak it can't even climb the tree to jump the 3 feet. So we have a long way to go. We have a lot of things to build in between before we go build digital India. We need to build the India which can absorb a digital India. Otherwise we are going to create a new caste system. And then worry about it 10 years later. We have to create the framework. And I believe partners together. There is so much work to do. One man can't do it alone. One sector can't do it alone. We have to recognize the strength of all sectors. Learn to work with each other. Fight with each other. Protest against each other in a non-confrontational way collaboratively find solutions for India. That's my belief. I have so many hands. Go over wants to Let's speak. You want to pass the mic? Yes. Yeah. You've given the uh, chromium blade experiment. I want to, you said that you've done a lot of these experiments and you're very successful. You had done these experiments and very successful. Could you give us one example of a developmental model where the environment was not harmed, where the average person was happy, you know, without harming, because as a person, when I see, either I see poverty or I see excess. And for me, if you ask me, the answer is that this is the reality. Either you survive or you don't survive. I mean, it might seem cynical, but if you could give an example, one specific example of a, a community or a system that worked sustainably. Let me give you examples to substantiate both of your arguments. Okay. I live in an area where it's, the taluk is one third forest. It was two thirds forest. 60 years ago, now it's one third forest. Now we've got a national path, so the degradation is ending slowly. I live in an area where the four reservoirs built, the same taluk, small taluk of quarter million people. I live in an area where 27 megawatts of power is produced. And if every house in the block where I live, of 250,000 250, people, is energized with electricity, if every borewell in that area is energized, then we change rural agriculture. Okay? The peak load demand on electricity will be 6 megawatts. We produce 27. What are we getting? One and a quarter megawatts. So there's so much of inequity that people are losing out in the battle. It's a policy. I'm just giving you one extreme. Where, and that's why the rich get richer. City of Bangalore consumes 56 percent of Karnataka's electricity. With only one crore population, one sixth of the population. Obviously, you'll have Narayan Murthy's and Azim Prem just flourishing there. A rural tribal who has got one hour of power a day is obviously not going to flourish. So there is a barrier that you are constructing around him which he cannot surmount on his own. He needs a facilitative hand of the government. That's one extreme story. So what do we do? How do we create a model which can work on its own? Well, I changed the equation. I built a solar battery power bank. My children come to school not with their tiffin boxes. They come to school with the small little batteries. They come and plug it into the school's solar panels. Every child, is, it's only for 10 standard children. When they graduate from 9th and go into 10th, they all get a small battery back, bank. If they come and plug it into the solar panel, go back home, it works exactly for 4 hours. Every day it gets charged, they take it back home, 6 to 10 in the night, they have power to study. And today we have a generation of young tribal children who are either nurses, teachers, forest guards or watchers. And someday they'll become a doctor. They're now becoming plastic technologists. Two of them are becoming engineers. And I'm hoping someday they'll become a doctor and replace me and my team too. Now that's a very quiet revolution using technology and using this limitation that we have and renegotiating the situation. Other extreme, I'll give you another story. My self-help group women are really self-help. What do they do? We grow ragi. That's all we have. That's the only asset we have. We have elephants. They are Asia's largest elephant corridor. So whatever ragi they grow, half of it goes to the elephants. So just we say, okay, what, is, what do you do with the remaining half? Right? We say we'll, we'll process, we'll produce. 
So with low energy, using solar, we dry up the ragi, then we grind it, crush it, make a weaning product out of it. Every self-help group makes a small manufacturing base, put it all together, the federation has got a store which sells it, and they're all making money quietly. My self-help group's annual turnover is seven crores today, tribal self-help groups, it's the quiet revolution. We didn't stop there, this was my micro experiments. Five years ago we realized, if you want to make a change, capture power. That is the reality of India. How did we capture? We didn't make the street demonstrations that Arvind and Anna did. I was part of them. I withdrew from team Anna after we started fighting. But we did it quietly. We trained our tribals to quietly equip themselves to become intelligent politicians, but monitored by the communities they come from. Five years of training. Last six months ago, there was a panchayat election in Karnataka. There are 36 panchayats in the, my taluk I work from. We said we are going to have one woman or man in every panchayat. That is the target we took. Today, without a rupee being spent, with all the electoral rubbish you see outside, without spending one rupee, just in the power of social capital that I am talking about, these women and the power of seven crores that they control, not by spending it, but by saying that you are all party to it. So let's all decide we are going to get the people we want. They voted, made sure that their woman or their man, out of 36, 28 are women, eight are tribal men. Six of them have become presidents of their panchayats today. We have captured political power without a revolution and they will make a difference now. So these are quiet stories and we are getting there. And these are models which are working. I am not even exaggerating. You cannot, any of you can visit my areas and see it for yourself. Which can be imitated. Which can be replicated. An expression of human capital. It is five years of investment. It is a powerful social network that we have of self-help groups and collectives. And we transact it in that environment and use it for public good. We can do this. We can do any number of, we have done any number of experiments. Drinking water. I spoke of 40% having safe, unsafe drinking water. We realized our water across the taluk doesn't have a chemical contamination. Our problem is bacteriological contamination. Our problem is it's a river flowing. You know how in public health we talk about a river. We take we say a river is a direct connection between the aboral end of people living upstream and the oral end of people living downstream. And we run through a forest. All the carcasses fall into the river. People drink it. But we drill bore wells, but we also get river water. What do we do? We train our self help groups to make money out of it. We don't give them high energy RO filters that Karnataka government is doing now. It takes away a lot of water in that. We give them simple sodium hypochlorite, the small little 50 ml bottle. Put four drops into 20 liters of water, allow it to sediment for 20 minutes, pour it out and drink. And the women market it to the other women. The self help group buys sodium hypochlorite in bulk, puts it in small bottles, sells it out to every group. They have safe drinking water and I have not had a single diarrheal death for the last 15 years. I am proud to say that is building human capital, that is creating social capital. Simple experiments. Okay. And I can keep talking about the different experiments. I have the entire book that I am talking about called I the Citizen is about ordinary people like this who have done extraordinary things by themselves and we are changing the world one man at a time, one village at a time. If all of us do it together, we can start changing the world one country at a time. Let's begin with India. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so in your talk till now, you uh, talked about things that uh, directly impact the life of people like products or institutions. But uh, many of us here uh, may be interested in fundamental science and uh, can take research in fundamental science which uh, cannot uh, impact the life of people directly because uh, like it's a long process uh, if you uh, discover something about space then it cannot be related to uh, uh, life of poor uh, people in uh, in our country so how how you see the uh, fundamental science uh, research uh, in uh, in the vision of uh, development of india the first thing i would do is disagree with you i for a minute do not believe fundamental science cannot make life better I have used fundamental science. Let me complete. ISRO has been one of my partners. Even before telemedicine became a fashion, we actually had linked up our mobile health unit and two hospitals with technology from ISRO, very high cost, but as a model. And because somebody is breaking their heads about all these on transponders and satellites and putting all the things that you people put together, I am using it. It is not about technology being directly used when you do it. It is about application of technology. That is why the only thing that's missing is can you talk to practitioners? 
can you just talk to me and find out what are the needs and then help me find solutions. Today we have such labs, right? I am working with MIT. MIT has got a media lab. MIT has got a lab which only works with the problems I give them. And we are now creating an app which is going to be an app for our women where every week we are going to ensure that content gets downloaded onto their app based on what I tell the content generator, based on what the community women have told in the meeting that they want. So every group gets a specified download of information that they need. It could be vegetable for purchase price to how to take care of menstruation in your young girl who's got menstruation for the first time or breastfeeding for somebody else. Their current problem, how do you download content? Who's helping me? It is people like you. So I only frame the problem. I'm only asking you to talk to me. That's all collaborate. That's a collaboration I spoke about. You're not expert in social development. You're an expert in science. I'm an expert in social development. Let's talk to each other. I had an unfortunate responsibility at Harvard. Where did I learn this? At Harvard. How? By not being able to do it. My job at the Hauser Center as a fellow was to bridge the academician practitioner gap. I had an excellent set of academicians across Harvard who were doing, writing great papers and publishing about the problems of the world and how to solve it, but none of it is implementable. I was working with the top 10 NGOs of the world. Collectively, their budgets were $15 billion, much more than USAID at that time. They had the questions, but they didn't have the researchers who could give them the answers. Each one of contempt with each other. Academicians think the practitioners are idiots. Practitioners think that the academicians are fit for nothing. They live in ivory towers. And my job given to me is how do I get them to talk to each other to solve real world problems. I failed. That is when I started Gram. Gram is an agency which captures people's voices, presents it to top quality researchers to decode and deconstruct it, find information with empirical evidence, go back and present to government and advocate for change. So we need, we need to partner. So I for a minute don't believe that you are not contributing. I for a minute believe you don't know where to put your contributions. And if you can talk to each other, we'll find a way. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we are now running out of time. So may I request you to please take your seat. And uh, so before... Uh, for the rest of the answers, buy my book. Yes, after the uh, word of thanks, you can always discuss with Dr. Balu. So a small event, as we have already announced, a book launch. The book's name is I, the Citizen, authored by Dr. Balu and co-published by Vision India Foundation. So we have a representative from Vision India Foundation, Shri Aman Gupta, a very small, you know, by data about him, a young alum of IIT Delhi, and he worked in a New Jersey-based management consultancy firm before deciding to do something more worthwhile. Currently pursuing a master's program for practitioners in public policy and governance. He is a program director at Vision India Foundation. This is an initiative by IIT alumni and faculty members to engage the motivated youth in the modern nation building movement. So this Vision India Foundation is also the co-publisher of Dr. Balas Burmanian's book, I, the Citizen. Now I request our Honorable Director to come onto the stage for the book launch. I'm actually proud to be one of the founding advisors. So this gives hope, right? Young IITians wanting to make a difference with the vision for India. Come on. Thank you for the privilege to have you Now, I request our Honorable Director to say a few words about Dr. Balu's lecture. I first like to take the opportunity to thank Dr. Balu Subramaniam for being here. And, you know, just by uh, looking at the crowd here, uh, Dr. Balu Subramaniam, let me tell you, this is the largest crowd that I've ever seen in this uh, uh, auditorium. And, uh, you know, almost every week we hold an art. So it's the power of your thoughts that has made this. And, I, you know, I think to a certain extent, uh, all of you uh, students here, you'll see that it's that 
45 to 50 to maybe 55 age group people who have actually left what they did very well and have worked for making this country great again. And I think you read, all of you need such role models. And I'm, I thank Dr. Balasubramaniam for being such a role model. But I think ultimately, please understand that what he says is what it's all about. Which is why I think today, what we need are not more business entrepreneurs. What we need is more social entrepreneurs. And I think all of you, I would urge you to really, really think through and see how you can help society. And in helping society, you're actually helping yourself. You know, when you, when you actually try to make life slightly different for a, for a group of people, you're actually discovering what you are. And I'm sure Dr. Bala Subramaniam, when he was at, uh, at Harvard, hadn't discovered as much about his, himself as he has done in the last 15 years working in Karnataka. So discover yourself and work for the country. I think we can almost certainly say that the 21st century should be about India, but not quite the India that the government is talking about, but the India that Dr. Balasuramun just spoken about. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Now I request our director to present a memento to our guest speaker. Now, this is the time for a vote of thanks. So, first of, all, first of all, I would like to thank our guest speaker, Dr. Balas Brahmanyam, uh, who launched this book yesterday in Prime Minister's office. And in the evening, the same lecture was held at IIT Delhi. And uh, I thank you very much for coming over all the way from Karnataka to IIT Rurki and for your thought-provoking speech. Personally, I feel this is more relevant and when the country is celebrating Gandhi Jayanti tomorrow. And uh, I thank Dean Srik and Associate Dean Srik for their constant support to the Institute Lecture Series. And uh, I thank everyone uh, who came here and listened to Dr. Balu very patiently. And I personally thank Vision India Foundation's representative, Sri Aman Gupta, and their volunteers. So thank you to one and all. <laughs>